Hey guys, this is a very brief introduction to the course Original Buddhism, or as I gave it the cheeky title, What the Buddha Actually Taught. What do we mean by Original Buddhism? Well, there's a movement these days that tries to get back to what the actual Buddha did teach. This is because in the modern day there are many superstitions, there are many practices, there are many customs, and especially there's a lot of modern revisionism into what did the Buddha actually teach. So original Buddhism is trying to get back to as close as we can to the actual words, the actual teachings of the historical Buddha. Now it could be that later teachings have something to add to Buddhism. They may have better practices, certainly there's adaptations to the culture, there's adaptations to the time. So we're not actually saying that original Buddhism must be the best, but we do try to get back to these original teachings so that before we start to reinterpret things, we can actually know what the original teachings were. Now there are three main sections of the teachings in the oldest record that we have. And this is as recorded in the Pali Canon. Now the Theravada school of Buddhism is the one that contains the Pali Canon. However, within the Pali Canon there's a lot of reinterpretation, a lot of commentary. So the Theravada tradition itself is not really original Buddhism. But within the Canon, the Pali Canon that we have in the Theravada, it's within that canon that we can find the original teachings of the Buddha, or as close as we can possibly get. Now the first of these sections is the Vinaya, and this contains the rules for the monks and nuns. Now you probably see the newspapers in the modern day, and see all the terrible things that the monks get up to, and you always think they wouldn't have done that in the Buddha's day, or that things are going downhill. Well I promise you, the stories that we find in the Vinaya will curl your hair. There really are stories of the terrible things that the monks and the nuns and the lay people got up to, which caused the Buddha to lay down all these rules and regulations. Aside from that, we also have a lot of guidelines for how the Sangha is supposed to act, how they make meetings, how we come together and how we solve problems. Finally, there is a historical record from the time of the enlightenment of the Buddha onwards. And here we see the teachings laid out in a chronological order. Next part of the teachings is the suttas, and this is the one that most people are interested in, and this is the one that we will be basing our course on here in Bangkok. These suttas are split into various sections. There's long suttas, middle length suttas, shorter suttas. The word sutta itself means thread, and a sutta is where the teachings were codified and put together in an agreed upon format and then recorded. So suttas were meant for recitation, and this makes them rather difficult to read. The last section of the Pali Canon is called the Abhidhamma, and the Abhidhamma was an attempt to get all of the information out of the teachings and arrange it into a kind of cosmology, into a kind of philosophical, complete picture. Now, many different schools of Buddhism had very different Abhidhammas. The Abhidhammas vary a lot, and this is one of the reasons why modern day scholars say that the Abhidhamma is a much later teaching, a later addition to the canon. So, if we want to get back to the original teachings, we really have to look into the Sutta and the Vinaya as our best guide. So that's a flying overview of the Pali Canon, the way it's divided up. Next we want to briefly look at the way that societies would record wisdom. And there were three main methods for recording wisdom, for recording teachings. Now, in very old societies, it wasn't really necessary to record very much. From parents to children, you could teach people how to catch animals, how to make needles out of bones, how to make thread and cloth and this kind of thing. 
later societies had a differentiation or a separation of jobs. So a blacksmith would teach that trade, the scribe would, live, would teach that trade, the farmers would teach that trade. So there was a specialization and a differentiation in the knowledge that was passed down through societies. However, if you want to grow a society further than that, you need to have other methods of recording wisdom. The three main methods that have been used throughout the ages are writing down, recitation and stories only. So let's look at the first of those three methods, the writing. You probably think that something's only really well recorded once it's written down, right? Well, think again. Because writing was not considered to be a very good form of record keeping. First of all, writing is stored outside of yourself and not in the human mind where it belongs. It's only accessible to people who had learned how to read and write. Writing was mostly done on banana leaves and papyrus and things like this, which were subject to fire, subject to flood, subject to mold, subject to deterioration. Furthermore, when you make copies of something that is written down, if you make a mistake, that copy records the mistake. And every subsequent copy also includes that mistake. So over a period of time, as the copies multiply, so the mistakes multiply and the record is deteriorating. So the second method of record keeping was recitation. And this is as close as we can get to an MP3 recording from the time of the book. Recitation is fantastically accurate. What happens is, once a teaching has been given, it's codified. And that code is put into a stanza, is put into a particular form that is easy to remember. Think about it this way. If you've had a conversation with Frank Sinatra for 10 minutes or half an hour, could you remember what he said? Very difficult to remember exactly what he said. But can you remember a song that he had sung? Now that's very easy to remember. So recitations were like this. This was after the teaching had been given, the monks would meet and agree on what were the core essences of what had been taught, and they would put it together into stanzas. A little bit like in the modern day, you see these listicles. You know, the six ways to lose fat very quickly, or the 12 ways to live a happier life, etc. When you put things into lists and codified in this way, they become much more easy to remember and much more impactful. Now, the recitations were memorized by groups of monks, and each monk would go and memorize a vaga or a section. And then every two weeks, he would come and he would recite his section to the monks who would memorize other sections. So in this way, not only were they practicing, but they were exchanging their information. Once you'd finished learning one vaga, the monk would then change groups and go into another group and learn that set of recitations. How accurate are they? Well, a couple of years ago in Bangkok, we did a recitation of the Dhammachaka Sutta, which is the original teaching that the Buddha gave after his enlightenment. And there was an English monk, a Bangladesh monk, and a Sri Lanka monk. And all of us were able to recite this key original teaching word by word, perfectly in unison. The last key advantage that we have of recitation is that it's very difficult to make changes. If 10,000 people across 100 miles or 200 miles across the whole continent have learned a particular chant and recitation, how can somebody come along and change it? Very difficult to introduce changes if everybody has memorized something. The last form of record keeping is story. Now, story has a number of advantages and disadvantages. By using bizarre characters interacting in different ways, stories are much, much more memorable. You can tell stories to children and they will remember them. There is an emotional message, an emotional wisdom that is transmitted in a story. And in particular, role models that you can live up to. So stories go deep into the subconscious, deep into the unconscious. And there they will change your behavior, they will change the way that you interpret the world. 
and the way that you act. Obviously, stories are subject to change every time the story is told. In many cases, this means the story is improved with age. However, as a historical record, the stories are not a very good form of record keeping. The Buddha himself did use stories. Fortunately, he always explained what his stories meant and how they were to be interpreted. And those stories have also been recorded by recitation. So, I hope you've enjoyed this very brief overview of what is meant by original Buddhism. And I hope that you will be able to join and see some of these original teachings and how they worked.